Good morning, everyone, and happy Sunday. It is wonderful to see you here. You know, there's a little bit of a shroud of mystery on the topics we're covering today, and I promise you it is going to be a good one. It's great to see you all. Today, we're going to cover some unusual Victorian jewelry trends, and these are not the ones that you hear spoken about most often. So these are some of the pieces that you might come across and wonder what on earth is this and why does it exist? So we've got six topics plus a bonus today that we're going to cover. It is great to see you all. Hi Gina, hi Lisa, hi Timeless Jewelry, Debra and Debra and Le uh, other Lisa. Wow, we have so many people. It's fantastic to see you all. I hope you're having a great weekend. So for anybody that is new, the purpose of the Sunday Brunch is to share our love of jewelry. We share research, identification, hints and tips to be able to identify what you have. And then we also do a little bit of a live hunt at the end. You can enter to win a exclusive Sunday Brunch mug by entering hashtag win all caps. I'm going to quickly throw that ticker up. So please help each other out to enter the giveaway. And we are going to go through some fantastic items today. So I'm really, really excited to share these pieces with you. Often when people think about Victorian jewelry, they think about Queen Victoria. They think about, you know, the romantic period, hearts, some trefoils. They also think about mourning jewelry and a lot of dark jewelry that was worn after her husband died. Those are not our topics today. So I'm very excited to share some different pieces with you. Hello, Amy. Hi, Delia. Hi, Janda. It's great to see you all. Without further ado, we are going to jump in, get those hashtag wins in. Good morning, Miranda. And then we will do the draw after we go through the presentation. So let's jump right in and get ready to do it. Here we go. Now, the first thing that we're going to talk about is some jewelry that you may have even come across yourself when you're out and about, maybe at a thrift store or at an antique mall. It is the Verge Fusée watch cock jewelry. Now, what exactly is that? We're going to take a look at some pieces in a moment, but first we have to talk about the trend. So the Verge escapement is the oldest mechanical a mechanism for statements in watches, and it was developed in the 16th century. And what it was, was a balance wheel, a hairspring and pallet that regulated the movement in watches. And it's important to understand how watches were made in order to understand why these components were turned into jewelry. So this was the innards, the inside of a watch. And here we have that watch cock piece that you start to see in jewelry. They were quite elaborate. Often they were gilt, so covered in gold. And these watch clocks were used in the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries. Now, as technology innovated and new movements were added for watches, what that meant was that these pieces no longer were useful. And as watches were repurposed or scrapped for their metal, some clever jewelers and crafters upcycled them and turned them into jewelry. So here we have the piece. It is the watch cock and its purpose really was to cover the balance wheel to make sure that nothing could get in there so that the watch would run tickety boo. Very important piece of a watch's construction. And now we jump into the jewelry. So as these watches were scrapped, people were repurposing the metal what they would do is they would save them because they often had really beautiful elaborate engraving on them and they would turn them into everything from bracelets to necklaces to earrings. And this is a wonderful example that shows you how five seemingly different pieces, but with the same purpose and same general look to them can be kind of stitched together. And these were really upcycled in antiquity. So if you do come across them today, um, they are usually from the early Victorian period. They were popular all the way through and they even had a resurgence towards the end of the 19th century as well. Here is a pair of earrings. Note how they are the same but different. So both top and bottom components have that wonderful kind of filigree look to them. And these were all hand done and really quite beautiful, all engraved, but they're complementary and yet not the same. 
And here is a fantastic necklace from Boiler PF Antiques. And this one is also studded with turquoise. So sometimes they would even re-dip them or make sure that they have very nice gold covering or gilt covering on them. And then they would put additional gemstones in them. So it was a beautiful trend that was kind of the original recycling of pieces for jewelry, very steampunk and ahead of its time. You got it, Deborah M. That is exactly right. So next up, we are going to jump straight into our second jewelry trend. Welcome, Daria. Welcome, Donna. It's wonderful to see you all. Hello, Jennifer, Carol, Barbara, a new start, Trina, Sue, Amy. Wow, so many people have just arrived. I'm going to remove this for just a second and say hello. Today we are talking about some really special Victorian jewelry trends that are unusual and probably not ones that you have heard about in the past. So the goal today is to share what pieces might be that you come across that you might not understand how they have fit into the fabric of culture. We're going to share quite a few more and make sure you get those hashtag win all caps in for a chance to win a mug as well. Okay, so next up we have Stanhope jewelry. Now, if you're familiar with Stanhopes, many people think of them as almost like a little peeping lens or a way to see an image of something. And they are often connotated with nude images, but it didn't start out that way. So Stanhope jewelry is really about having a beautiful lens that is put into a piece of jewelry. Charles, the third Earl of Stanhope was an inventor and he did a lot of work to come up with a lens. Now, when he did his work, which was really the early 1800s, there was no camera that had a microfilm that would allow him to put film into his pieces. So it really focused more on drawings, um, miniaturized, obviously. And then there'd be a lens that you would have to essentially hold up to your eye so that you would be able to see the pieces. Now, this is an original tool he is credited in many ways for being the inventor, and his name is used interchangeably with this jewelry, but at the end of the day, you're going to find out that there is another man who played a very pivotal role. Early Stanhope pieces often had religious uh, connotations to them, things like crosses or needle cases or little aid memoirs that women would carry would often have a little Stanhope. These were usually in base metal or in materials that were not precious, and they would be able to depict an image. These images were very, very beautiful, and sometimes they were religious icons like we saw. Sometimes they were also favorite places or vacation places. Here we have a seascape, and this one is embedded in an agate pendant, and we will take a look at where this one is available just a little bit later in our shopping segment because it is available online for sale. But as mentioned, really it's the photography that people think of when they think of Stanhopes. So we need to get into the details, but first we're going to take a closer look at what the mechanism looks like. This being an early Stanhope, you would put your eye up to it and there's that engraving that you're able to see. It's difficult for most to capture what these images look like, but it gives you an idea. You can twist and turn it, and often women, and it was usually women who would have um, the pictures that were religious or of favorite places, they would have these as prized possessions because they were really special memories. And this was how they were able to have an image of something that was meaningful to them. These became popular with men a little bit later on, and we'll talk about why, but first we need to talk about René Degram. So he was a Parisian and he was a photographer and also an inventor. And in 1859, he patented tiny, tiny microfilm as a way to get images into these pieces as well. So once he came up with his invention, and these are some later pictures, Items like photos of the French royal family, Queen Victoria during her jubilee, and many, many other things were able to be put into these special pieces. Now, before we take a look at some of, or one, we will look at one new did together, uh, jewelry, we need to talk about his impact on French society and Europe as a whole, because René Decron has a very interesting story. He was very important 
with the siege of Paris because he operated essentially the early pigeon post. He left Paris just at the time of the siege by hot air balloon and he developed a way of creating tiny, tiny microfilm that allowed him to photograph newspapers or others to photograph newspapers, put them into carrier pigeons, little carrier, let's call them tubes that were attached to their legs. And then they would go with information that could be projected on a wall um, and people could understand exactly what was happening very, very quickly in different cities at that point in time. So he was able to help get information in and out of Paris, which was very important. In fact, there's even a monument that was created that has the hot air balloon, pigeons, and also cameras uh, all associated to it. And this was uh, something that was up, up until it was destroyed during World War II in Paris to celebrate the importance that he had for the effort of freeing the city. Now, here is the piece of jewelry that you are probably all waiting to see. This is a special ring. It is an Art Nouveau ring, so it's a little bit later, and the Stanhope is in the side. So this is a little lens, and you would hold it up to your eye, and it would allow you to see an image. And in many cases, this is a gentleman's rings, they would become naughty images. So you can probably just make this out. We have a reclined woman with no clothing on, just relaxing. Uh, and this is sort of an example of what Stanhopes are best known for today. They're all highly collectible and I will take you to a couple of websites a little bit later on in our session so that if you are interested in acquiring one, you are able to find one for yourself as well. And yes, to answer your questions, the first cross did have a Stanhope in it and it had the religious imagery. And there are actually Stanhopes that can even have multiple images in them. Um, I will share my screen just a moment so that you can see this. We've got an example that is on a Stanhope website that has many, many examples. And I will take you here for a full view. But this is an expensive example, over $2,000. And it is a knife that's got five different uh, images in it. It is a George William Corn pocket knife, antique. But this is an example of how they would manage to get so many different images in. It would require one lens. This one was not a changing, or actually, sorry, it, it would be spun, but it's one lens and then images that can be rotated. So very interesting Stanhope lenses. I'm going to catch up and make sure that I did not miss any questions. Hello, Robin. Hello, Carol and everyone. Hi, Sue. I hope you're all having a wonderful Sunday. So we've now covered two of our Victorian jewelry trends. We've talked about our Verge Fusé upcycled jewelry. We've talked about Stanhopes. And next we're gonna talk about the Rose of Sharon. Hi, Judy, great to see you. The Rose of Sharon. Now, this is a fantastic and fascinating story. The name can be a little bit confusing because the Rose of Sharon and plants really was named for plants that were along the Mediterranean in the western part of Israel. No one knows for sure what flower it is and often they are said to be hibiscus yet others say that perhaps it's the crocus and others still suggest that maybe it's a tulip or another flower altogether. Now, what a Rose of Sharon piece of jewelry is, is a beautiful ring that is inlaid with a gemstone, usually a diamond, sometimes a pearl, and it also has essentially gold that is going to depict a flower. So this is a beautiful example. And these were popular during Victorian times because of floriography. So if you're not familiar with floriography, it was uh, what they did to really assign a symbolism to plants, flowers, vegetation, and then they would be able to have secret coded messages either in bouquets or in other jewelry or depictions or drawings just by having certain combinations of flowers and leaves together. So the Rose of Sharon, why this one was particularly popular was because it depicted 
perseverance and longing. And this was because they say that the Rose of Sharon, although no one is sure what flower it is, was long blooming and very hardy. And these became particularly popular in the USA during the Civil War when couples were apart. Um, so there are quite a few examples from the 1860s period. Here's one example, it's quite beautiful. Take a look at all the wonderful claws. We also have one here with three flowers. You can see the diamonds quite clearly inlaid on an amethyst. And the amethyst was the most common piece that was, or I should say gemstone that was being used. And again, amethysts were quite rare at that point in time because the mines were not fully discovered. Here is another example. Again, that same floral look and the trefoil, the trefoil being a little bit of a religious nod. And here is a citrine example. So you can come across them, they're harder to find. Sometimes you can even find agate examples um, like or a carnelian. These are beautiful and we will take a look at a couple. Usually they run you probably about six to $800 or so. And then the price will also change with how many other stones, quality of the metal and how it's been uh, fabricated. So this is the Rose of Sharon, a beautiful symbolic way of passing along a secret message. And our next topic is similar in nature. So I'm sure you've come across brooches or rings that are studded with multicolor gemstones. And sometimes those have a hidden meaning too. And that is all about acrostic jewelry, which we're going to jump into next. So acrostic jewelry was when a secret message was spelled out using gemstones. And this is something that became popular because of Malerio, a jeweler in France who started to create special pieces for royalty. And even Chomet picked up on this. They were popular in the late Georgian period and then particularly in the Victorian period. I wanted to share a bit of an acrostic gem dictionary with you because it can be really hard to read what these gemstones say if you don't know what they stand for or what the colors could be related to. So if you want to grab a screenshot of this, you are more than welcome to. We've got um, some of the older names that were used for gemstones as well. So you have to remember that gemstones sometimes change names over time. For example, the peridot was once known as olivine. So if you have an O in a word that you're trying to spell, it could very well be a peridot. And that can throw us folks off if we're not sure how to translate the old word for the gemstone to the newer word as well. The most common words that we're going to see are things like dear, dearest, adore. So we'll look at some examples, but this gives you a rough dictionary that is used. Now, what can also be very, very confusing is that this was not just done in the English language, it was done in all languages. So if you are in another country that is not English speaking, it is important to know what the translations are for the gemstones of the period so that you know what these pieces of jewelry say. Here are three of the commonest, word, commonest words that you are going to see in jewelry today. In part, why these were popular is because they were short. So we have dear, adore, and regard, where D is a diamond, E is an emerald, A is an amethyst, and R is a ruby. The O I've used opal, but as you saw, it could be olivine or other examples as well. And so you can have some fun making up words, and, or I should say making up patterns, not so much words, with these beautiful gemstones. And now we're going to look at a few examples. So this first ring starts with a stone and I'll tell you what it is in just a second, but take your guess, feel free to throw it into the chat. Take a guess as to what you think this might be. It is one of those common words. We've got a ruby to get us started, then an emerald. Yes, we do. Then we have a garnet, and this is a beautiful rhodolite garnet, which is why it is more on the pink side of the family. We've got an amethyst, another ruby, and a diamond. And Kathleen Pickens, I see you first, is getting that in as regard. Yes, Jane, I see you too. And Daria, 
Good job, everyone. That is exactly what this ring says. Here we have it, ruby, emerald, garnet, amethyst, ruby, and diamond at the end. Well done. Amy, I see you too. We have a couple more examples like this that we're going to go through for a little bit of fun. Next up, we've got this brooch. Now, sometimes in this wonderful acrostic jewelry, jewelers were clever and they would add a few extra embellishments to throw you off. So the key here is to know that there are only four stones that spell out the word. The pearls are simply there to throw us off the chase. There is no word that has diamond, 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 pearl, diamond, diamond in it. <laughs> so we've got four. Take a guess at this one. Jagar, I see you in. Amy Ann, yes, you are very, very close. Kathleen, I see you. It is indeed dear. You are all fantastic and doing well. Good morning, Kathy. It is another beautiful example. And this one is a later piece. It was popular all throughout to the Victorian era and, era, and even into the Edwardian period too. I'm glad you're enjoying this. Thank you, Judy. Okay, here we have a little locket, or it, really it's more of a purse. So this opens and it is, has a little fully empty compartment where things could be kept, maybe some smelling salts, a little bit of, not tissue, but a handkerchief. Take a look at this one. We have one, two, three, four, five, six letters that are going to go into it. Again, beginning with one specific stone. There may be some repeats. I'm going to tell you that so that you don't think I'm trying to trick you. So whether you think that is a ruby, emerald, garnet, we do indeed have another regard. You are fast. Okay. You're training your eyes very well. And hopefully if you see any of these out and about, you'll know exactly what it is. And these are extremely collectible. They have had a resurgence in popularity in the last five years. This one is indeed a regard. And we've got two more to go through. This is another example. We'll do this one quickly because it is a similar word that we've seen a couple of times, regard yet again. But it's nice to see all of the different shapes and the way that these were made. So this is an earlier piece. This one is likely from more of the mid 19th century. And we can tell that based on the style of the setting. And then finally, the last one. And this one is a little bit of a challenge because it has, again, some bonus gemstones that do not need to be factored in. It is a beautiful example. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of a hint. You can disregard the bows. <laughs> on either side. Regard is like love. It means like I hold you in regard. Great question, Jagar. So this is like a sweater clip or a cloak closure and disregard the bows and disregard that pearl heart drop at the bottom. And we'll give you a moment to take a look at this. We are not missing a stone. It may just be a little bit hard to hear, or to hear, to see. Why don't I just tell you, it is a diamond. So again, this would have been produced when old cut diamonds were used. And so they can be um, a little bit included. I think that is probably what you're seeing. We've got a diamond, emerald, amethyst, ruby, emerald, spinel, and a turquoise to spell dearest. I'm sorry if it was hard with that <laughs> missing stone. Yes, good job. You have got it. Well done. You are now acrostic jewelry experts and you will be able to identify this jewelry when you are out and about. Um, and you'll be able to decode what other people might be wearing too if you see someone in the antique jewelry community wearing one of these pieces. Now, the color of stones can also have specific meaning. And next we're gonna talk about Jubilee jewelry. Jubilee jewelry was produced for Queen Victoria's Jubilees. She only celebrated two of them. She celebrated her golden Jubilee in 1887, and that is 50 years reigning, and then her diamond Jubilee in 1897, which is 60 years reigning. 
it was not popular back in the 19th century to celebrate a silver jubilee, which is 25 years. And Victoria in particular did not celebrate hers because six months before her anniversary date, that was when her husband passed away. So she was deeply in mourning. The whole country was in mourning. Oh, if you love puzzles, Jane, we have some great ones coming up. Um, but when we think about Jubilee jewelry and Queen Victoria, there are two types in my mind. There is the overt Jubilee jewelry that is a maybe a coin with her image that has been engraved and it has the year on it. Sometimes you find coins that are reverse set with the young Victoria and the older Victoria. Sometimes it has the year splashed bright and bold across it. They are absolutely beautiful, spectacular pieces and we will look at one example like that today although it has a little twist to it. Um, but the Jubilee jewelry we're going to look at is a little bit more secretive, similar to the acrostic jewelry. And so we will look at Jubilee jewelry that is depicted by the materials that are used. Now the Union Jack has red, white, and blue. And at the time of the Jubilee, there was a lot of nationalistic fervor, very positive nationalistic fervor. And so sapphires, diamonds, and rubies were used in many pieces to kind of show the love for the country and for queen. Um, and this is an example of a brooch like this. So when you find pieces that are around the 1887 through end of the century that have these three primary depictions of stones or colors to them, um, they often are related to uh, England, essentially. So one thing to note that both diamonds and pearls were used as white, sapphires were generally used as the blue, and rubies were most commonly used as sort of that red, but sometimes garnets were as well. So we have a couple more examples to look at. Here is another brooch, has the trefoil on the end, lots of wonderful gemstones. This one's available at Cynthia Finley Antiques, and it is a beauty in gold. And here is a wonderful ring. So this one was created in uh, 1894. So between the Jubilees, but again, you can see those hallmarks, not clearly, but you know that those are definitely coming out of Britain uh, with that general shape to them. We have diamonds, ruby, and sapphire yet again. And I just love the style of claws that were used at that point in time in jewelry too. This is very typical for that last quarter of the 19th century. So that also can help the state pieces. We also have this beautiful ring example with rubies, pearls, diamonds, and a sapphire, another absolute beauty. And my personal favorite, and I have a ring similar to this, um, it has a diamond, a ruby and a sapphire, all prong set, a trefoil. Now the trefoil had some sort of religious connotations to it as well. And so this would have been a great example of something that someone would wear with pride, both for country and both for feeling like deeply moral too. I'm going to remove this for just a second so that I can share with you the similar ring that I have in my collection. Now mine has a Christ barrel that is a little bit washed out to it. So it's considered Jubilee jewelry. Um, we've got a star sapphire, that Christ barrel, sorry, a star ruby, <laughs> that Christ barrel and the sapphire. And then you can see how those prongs are set as well. Now, diamonds were one of Victoria's favorites. And around 1897, an innovation was made in diamond cutting in the US. And because it was on her diamond jubilee year, they decided to name it after her. And it was the Jubilee Diamond. Here is an image. It is a beauty. Now, what was special about the Jubilee Diamond is that it had 88 facets. Instead of having a flat table, it actually had eight additional facets, like a rose cut right on the top. So it actually ends kind of in that spiked tip, which is really quite interesting. Now I'm going to share a video with you so that you can see it in motion. And here we have it. The purpose of this cut was really to provide floral facets and a lot of light return. 
So it is absolutely a stunner. <laughs> and it is rare to come across these cuts today. Let's watch it again. As it turns to the side, you're going to be able to see that tip, which is like a rose cut. So this is a Jubilee diamond cut. There we have it. Now, not only diamonds were cut in this way, I actually have a brooch um, with an aquamarine that has this cut, which is fascinating. I did not know it when I had it, but it did help me to date it and also to identify that it was likely American as well. And I thought it was only fair to show you what this diamond could look like in a piece of jewelry. So here is a wonderful example. Um, and it just glows. So these are fantastic Jubilee diamonds. They are considered a very rare cut. And this one's by Coronet Diamonds. And there is a jewelry company and they're under the crown jewelry who have started to recut old cut diamonds in this pattern if it's something that anyone is interested in researching. So yet another form of upcycling kind of takes us full cycle back to the beginning of the presentation. Hello, Sue. Hope you're having a wonderful day. Hi, Sherry. Hi, everyone. We are moving along through some of our unusual Victorian jewelry trends. And next up, we have something that you may not have ever heard of, and it is rosette jewelry rosettes. We've got some little sneaky peekies on the screen right here. And this is one of the items that we teased in the thumbnail. If you arrived early, there was a little bit of chit chat where we were talking about what would the trends be. And I let everyone know that the image on the thumbnail included two pieces of jewelry that are going to be highlighted for their trends. So rosette jewelry is fascinating. This trend reaches back to the Renaissance era and some specialty stone cutting that was being done. What jewelers would do is sometimes they would have diamonds because they were basically being sort of knocked and chiseled in order to get their shape and they would set them in a rosette shape. Now this didn't continue to be popular for a long time, but this did provide some inspiration. So towards the turn of the century, before marcasites became popular, these rosettes were inspiration for what was almost like a little metal cap that would be placed on jewelry. And they were all put together um, in a pattern, kind of like you would set stones. This is a heart locket that's got a rosette. And I've tried to zoom in on one rosette as well as that pattern so that you can see exactly what it was supposed to replicate. This was also known as a pastry design or motif as well. And most of these are going to date right around the turn of the 19th century, so the end of the Victorian period. This one is indeed a piece of Jubilee jewelry. This is diamond jewel Jubilee set with rosettes. Um, now it's funny because they also created this piece to look like some of the rosettes are not there. So you can see in the one, there are four rosettes. In the eight, the rosettes are not completely all the way around. Same for the nine and seven. So just fascinating to see how they would try to take these um, details and make it look as natural as possible. This is another example in my collection and it is a horseshoe with a star. So anything that is celestial was popular during the Victorian period. We have crescent moons that were honeymoon brooches. We have horseshoes for luck, and this one is most certainly a horseshoe. And we can tell from the difference on the two ends, um, and it's meant to look like it has nails going through it with our little rosettes. Welcome, Joyce. Again, we have a very large example of a rosette in the center. We have a Charles Horner pendant and this is a small little piece and I will bring it up to show you in just a second so that you can see exactly how small it is but it's zoomed in well to see his usage of rosettes. Here you can see <laughs> in terms of size it is shiny which is why I love to be able to create these presentations in advance for you all so that you can be sure to be able to see all of the details. Um, this is a trend that really was only for a smattering of years. So I would say five years or so right at the turn of the century. And Charles Horner seemed to really enjoy 
this trend because not only did he create this little part with amber glass, he also made this peacock glass also surrounded by rosettes. And these are sterling silver. So all of the examples with the rosette are sterling silver. I will hold up the horseshoe for you so that you can see. There we have it. We've got our horseshoe. Here's the back with a very early clasp and hinge. And the way it was fabricated was um, really each little piece was added on. I've got some lint on here. That's what I get for keeping it in a jewelry box with that cotton. So this one would be for luck. Good morning, Doug. The first one, when you're saying the first one, do you mean this tiny, tiny little one, Jane? <laughs> so both of the hearts that were shown were very tiny. I was able to get this one on eBay from the UK and I think I paid $30 for it, which is a very good deal. I have seen them listed for astronomical prices. Um, keep your eyes peeled. Sometimes you'll find them when you search for Marcusite jewelry as well, because really that is kind of meant to be what the look is. Um, I've seen them listed for $300, but I am sure you can find better. I don't mind sharing what I've paid for pieces. So the horseshoe, this piece, I was able to find from a shop in Ireland, and this one was about $120. So I hope that gives you a little bit more context. There we go. All right. We are going to keep going. And next up is something that I teased in one of my videos, a short yesterday. If you didn't have a chance to see it, no worries, because I'm going to play you a video. But we are going to talk about Grillos and Grillos in jewelry. Hello, SMP. Now, what is a Grillos? Let's begin by taking a quick look so then we can talk about how it fits in. The term grillos refers to bizarre figural combinations, and it's derived from the Greek word caricature. And this is not something that was only found during the Victorian periods. So you may recall that I have a beautiful little fob with opaline glass that I traded for a sapphire ring. And this, I have a whole video on it, which I can throw into the description in case anybody wants to see it. But the grillos has many different faces, sometimes human, sometimes animal. Now, the reason why I'm sharing this today is because cameos were very, very popular throughout the Victorian period, particularly as the Victorians who were wealthy would do their grand tours and they would often pick up cameos when they were in the Mediterranean, sometimes just loose and have them set afterwards really beautiful pieces, sometimes shell, sometimes hard stone, sometimes they were intaglios. Uh, what we just looked at was not a cameo, that was an intaglio and it was Georgian. So it's a bit of a misnomer in our example, but these pieces have multiple faces. So I wanna go through and show you a couple things. We've got one face to the left, to the right. And if you flip the piece, then we have an animal as well as another face. Now, there are examples in Museum of Modern Art and several other museums, like the VA Museum, Victoria and Albert Museum. And again, you can see the point of this piece is that it has many, many depictions, often that they're mythological. And the symbolism was that it was meant to protect you. So essentially, these entities were meant to be your protectors and give you strength. So they were considered very, very lucky pieces. Here's another example, this one, again, with four pieces, four pieces, four faces, one, two, three, and whoops, I did not circle the fourth because it was upside down, my apologies. <laughs> and now we're going to look at this one. So this is a piece of, that I recently was able to get my hands on. It was initially sold to me as being made of a glass, but it actually is a hard stone, which made me very, very happy. But I had a little guessing game and I'm curious, how many faces do you see? I'm going to play a video that reveals the answer. Here it is. Uh, it is a fob. There are a lot of faces on here. 
and we are going to play that video now. Feel free to get your guesses in at any point during the video or after. We don't judge here. It's all for fun and learning. Here we go. we have it. The answer is six. It was a little bit tricky because number three is actually a creature and it kind of looks like a sphinx with a tail, kind of looks like a cat. Really hard to say what it is. Yes, Jagar, you see it. It's, it's a little animal. So fascinating piece. Brings me lots of joy. I have a lot of research to do on it to try to determine are any of these faces recognizable gods or goddesses or something that we should be able to trace back. So I will be looking into this some more and I'll share my findings with you all. But again, the trend is really cameos, but I've decided to embellish a little. Thank you so much for playing along with that one. We have another trend to go through and I am wearing it right now on my collar. The trend is related to literacy. So similar to the changes with watches that made the watch cock become something that was repurposed into jewelry, similar to how technology brought along photography, which allowed us to actually embed a little bit of uh, naughty images and pictures into Stanhope's, we have the way that literacy had accelerated flirting towards the end of the century, which is probably not something that you would expect to hear. Now, once upon a time, name brooches, just simple to read name brooches, were popular in manor houses so that servants' names would be on display. But as everyone became more literate, including those servants themselves, there became some fun and games that would be played with name brooches. So Jane, you like puzzles. Anybody who likes puzzles will enjoy puzzle names and puzzle jewelry, which is our next category. Let's take a look. First, here is a very simple one. It is easy to read. It says Emma, but it was meant to have a little bit of a guise and it probably belonged to a young girl because um, it is so simple to read, but it's got almost like tree trunks and the bark of trees that spell out the name, Emma, E-M-M-A. And then we also have some leaves to the outside as well, which is exactly what you would expect in terms of floriography. So here we have where Emma is, and this one is a very simplified version. Now we're gonna get into some more difficult puzzle name brooches. This one has five letters. <laughs> there is an A for Annie right in the middle, an N, and then another N off to the side. We have an I on the far left, and then an E on the far right. So the reason why I am taking you through reading them in this way is because we are also going to play a game where we try to decipher some of these puzzle name brooches. I've got a few of them in my collection. They bring me great joy. <laughs> um, but next, before we jump into the puzzle name brooch game, I do want to show you one more secret code puzzle word in jewelry. And this one is a locket. So this locket has some words on it that when you try to read it doesn't seem to make any sense. And after much research and deciphering, I eventually figured this out. I actually added it to my collection without knowing what exactly it said, um, but it turns out that there is an A, 
an S in terms of the largest letters, and then T-O-R-E or Tore. And what this says is Astor or Astore. It is a Gaelic word that means my treasure. And I can't think of a more fitting thing to put on a special locket that can hold either hair or photos or a picture. So again, these lockets were very popular, I would say from about 1870 to the end of the century. Um, and this is the Astore locket, which is both a puzzle and locket. Okay. It is time to look at one more example to train your eye and how to read these before we get into the game. This one is the one that I'm wearing, and there is a reason that I'm wearing this one. So it probably will not come as a surprise to most of you that, oh, this one says Jenny, and the and the J is not going to be very well reflected here. I think my letter sizing might be off. There's the E, <laughs> the N, another N on the other side, and the Y. So that spells Jenny. And I will tell you that normally these brooches, you can find them for around $120 or so online, sometimes a little bit less. I found the Jenny somewhat local to me in Canada, and they wanted a very pretty penny, but how often do you come across your name? <laughs> so I had to add it to the collection. We are now going to get into the game, and we're going to call it Who's That Girl? These are most often women's names, and every example that we have is indeed a woman's name today. I've actually not come across a man's name, but if you do happen to see one ever, flag it and let me know or pick it up for yourself because I suspect that they're much more rare. All right, we are going to go into round one. This one's not too hard. I'm going to give you a few moments to guess before I take you through the answer. Now, remember, these sometimes read left to right, and sometimes they sort of go in between center, left, right, left, right. This is a straightforward one. We've already got some yeses rolling in. And those of you who see Kate are spot on. Well done. Remember how these letters are formed. It's going to serve you well on some of our later examples. So the K is up in the left, then we have an A right next to it, we have a T that is overlaid, and then we have an E, and I'm going to have to resize these letters because, oh boy, <laughs> they are not overlaid very well. Okay. Are you ready for round two? Round two is gonna get a little bit harder. You have done the Kate. And this is what the Kate looks like in person. And these work really well over top of any color of material. So if you happen to go to a lot of events and have to socialize and you want to have some fun, these are great. Um, the reason why they were so popular for flirting is that women would wear them sometimes when they would go to parties or to socialize where there would be both men and women present. And then there could be a little bit of a game of getting in really close to each other to try and peek what was written and guess at names. So it kind of gave them a little something to talk about and a reason to get in a lot closer than they had been allowed to ever be before. All right, we are going to round two. And here we go. This one is tricky. I will tell you that right now. <laughs> but you may notice that there is um, a duplicate of a letter on either side. So this may give you a little bit more of a clue. I think that the lovely lady that would have worn this probably had people peering a little bit closely for a moment or two. But keep in mind, many names were popular during the same periods. Um, these were popular. so. Let's, I, and I won't give this one away, but you know, names like perhaps Edith, this is not an Edith, would be popular. Okay, we are gonna keep going and reveal this. Deborah is guessing Lizzie. We do have an L. 
we have an I, we have a Z and a Z on either side, and then you are so close, it is an I and an E. So if you spelt Lizzie, L-I-Z-Z-I-E, you're exactly right. Those are some great guesses. And what's interesting about the scripts that were used for pieces like this is that they're almost subjective. <laughs> they are very, very hard to read. And this is why it was so much fun for them to get together and take a look at these puzzle bridges. So fascinating little example. We will take a quick look at this. So this one, this Lizzie, is dated for uh, 1879. And then we do have another Lizzie, exactly, short form for Elizabeth. Now this Lizzie is a much easier to read puzzle brooch. And this one is same time period, about two years later. What's fascinating about them is that I seriously wonder if perhaps the simpler to read ones were meant for younger women. So it would be fun, but if big sister had one and little sister might have wanted one too, best to give her one that was simple to read, make sure that uh, <laughs> she was able to carry on with that trend, but not necessarily have anything that was quite so difficult that was really meant more to invite conversation. So these edging and patterns were extremely common during the Victorian period. Um, aesthetic brooches often have this cannonball detail to them. That's what it's called when you have those little balls that are all around. I'm going to hold up a couple. This one is actually uh, gilt, so it has a gold overlay on it. This one is silver. They are usually silver. The one that I'm wearing is North American based, and you can tell because there's the remnants of parts of a coin that was carved to use for this on the back. So it was a phenomena that was both in Britain, in North America, a little bit everywhere. Great question, Marlene. We have another round to go. Are you all ready for... So these are all silver except for the one which is essentially uh, gilded, um, but it is on a silver base. You can find them also made of other materials, such as jet. And then there was a resurgence in the 1950s of using wire in order to wrap names as well. We are now going to jump into round three. This is the hardest round. Buckle up. Okay, round three. It's a longer name and there's less spacing between the letters. <laughs> so glad to have you all here. Uh, I will slowly reveal some of the letters to try and help you, although the overlay doesn't help very much. I will give you a hint. This one does start on the left. Go to the right with some coming back to center. So keep that in mind. B is indeed the first letter. And it is on the far left. I'll give you a little more time. This is sort of a fancy sort of gothic script that was used. The next letter is an L. This is like Wheel of Fortune with puzzle names. <laughs> so we're, we're getting somewhere. Oh, Jane has a guess in of Blanche. And you are right. I'm just going to hold this, not keep you all in suspense. A is in the center. Then we've got an N that is towards the side. We've got a C, which is again, large and in the center. H, which is off to the side. And E, which is smack in the center, which spells out Blanche. So I think Blanche would have been <laughs> one that people spent a fair bit of time getting in on. I am very impressed at your ability to read this. There's that Blanche. <laughs> yes, definitely go through your jewelry stashes again. You may have some interesting hidden trends in there that you did not realize. And always ask yourself, why was something produced? Is there a reason um, that it exists? So 
thank you for playing along with that. Make sure now that you get the hashtag win in so that you are entered in the draw for a Sunday brunch mug because we are going to do that right away. And then I'm going to take you to a couple of websites. One, we're gonna take a look at a very well done website on Stanhope Jewelry that also offers some pieces for sale. And we are also going to take a look at some of the trends that I was able to find at both reasonable and less reasonable prices on gem.app. I've earmarked those for you. And then we'll do a little bit more browsing based on your requests as well. So please make sure it's all caps. Sherry and Lauren, I see your entries, but it's got to be all caps to be entered. Um, while you are entering for the mug, 20 ounces shipped free of charge directly to your house from me as a gift, I will tell you that our next Sunday brunch is going to be on amylite and organic gemstones. And that is going to be coming up on September 3rd. And it is a double header. So immediately following the Sunday brunch, we will be doing a extra scoop extra live where we do the antique roadshow style uh, presentation for all of those who are part of the extra scoop club if you're interested in joining that i've got a post under the community tab it's a few posts back but essentially if you join via youtube or patreon either way works um, what i do is take a look at pieces and do some research on them for you and give you an idea of what retail value could be like on it so it's lots and lots of fun all right Please get your win in. I'm going to check to see how many entries we have. We've got 25 and I'm going to share my screen and count that down and we'll do the draw. Thank you so much, Marlene. I appreciate you all being here. This is so much fun. Let's stop that banner from scrolling, present the screen that we need to make our draw and we are going to do it. So again, we've got 25 entries in. I'm just going to quickly count this down. So 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, and draw. Who will win the mug today? And it's Lisa S. Congratulations. I am going to stop sharing. If I can find my mouse, there we go. A lovely mug for you. And I believe I've got your address so I can take care of that. All right, I'm going to catch up on videos. Thank you so much, Judy. It's lovely to see you. Congratulations. Now let's take a quick look at some Stanhope jewelry and a great informative website. <laughs> That's awesome, Lisa. <laughs> Perfect timing. All right. This website is one that is dedicated both to the research and also to create almost like a mini museum of Stanhope jewelry. And they happen to sell some pieces at what is sometimes reasonable prices. Sometimes they are not. We previously looked at this example, which is the $2,000 art gallery, George William Korn pocket knife. Um, the website is stanhopemicroworks.com. So let's go here. I'm just going to show you a little bit about them. They have all sorts of information and a wonderful gallery as well. And what is great about them is that they are also capable of restoring old Stanhopes. So sometimes the lens would become dirty and that would make it impossible for anyone to enjoy the images that were found within. These folks are able to restore them, which is excellent. In addition to offering some antique Stanhopes, they can also connect you with having Stanhopes created. Um, and there's another company as well, and I'll link all of this into the live, into the description. But if you want to have a Stanhope made with an image of your own loved one, that is something that can be done today. So here's their custom photo Stanhope lens, which they're able to do. Um, they also do sell micro dots, which is like a spy coin which opens, and then they have micro photos for sale that are not even in a Stanhope as well. So 
fascinating information. <laughs> now, if you want to see where they have them for sale, they've got a link. They have a whole variety of sort of areas that they were created in. So whether you want a political one that is like civil war based or religious or risque, like that naughty that we looked at, they're all available here. And for us, I wanted to just jump briefly on the jewelry one because you are going to see compared to some of the other examples we'll look at, which are on gem.app, the jewelry that they offer here is sometimes a great value. So their prices are quite reasonable. This is $190. They do not show us the nude that is in this. So nude. The description tells us that it is a full length nude wearing only a petticoat and high heels shows bosom and butt. <laughs> so I have a feeling they mean it is meant for a man. Oh, it looks like it is recently sold, which that is a new update since I had previously found that for you. I hope that I did not disappoint anyone too much. There we go. Let's remove that. Um, question from Deborah M. Was it traditionally popular to have a loved one depicted? So the Stanhopes that were purchased initially or that were fabricated initially were often tourist pieces so that they could mass produce them. The loved one depicted is now something that is being done because production in the 20th century is dramatically different. <laughs> in the early part of the 20th century, that was where there was a lot of imagery that was used for like royalty. Um, and then people did, if they could afford to get some done, they could work with the jeweler, but it was more common to pick up the nudes and risque ladies than to have your loved ones put into them. So this is really a fairly recent phenomena. There has been a trend in the uh, 20th and 21st century to do a lot of personalization and customization. And that's actually a trend that's popular in retail today. So by day, I work in uh, technology for vertically integrated retailing manufacturing companies. And everyone wants to know, how do I personalize and customize things for my customers? So it's all coming full circle and back again. All right, we are going to take a look on gem.app. I do want to show you um, some items on there. I've earmarked a few things to share today, and I'll pop back to make sure that I see your comments as well. So let's share screen. And we will begin with gem.app again, which is an aggregator, which I really like. Um, what it does is it scrapes websites of our common marketplaces like eBay, Ruby Lane, Etsy, as well as other websites and pulls all the information together and works like a search engine, kind of like Google. So if you decide that you want to search for a piece, you're able to very quickly get an idea of what is available in the landscape. Um, I've connected it to my account so that when I save things, I'm able to quickly access them. So you may remember seeing this one today. And this is a beautiful view of the railway station, Dover and Ramsgate, Kent. This one's available from Park Avenue Antiques on Etsy. If you are interested, it is not inexpensive. Um, agate lockets are definitely having a bit of a resurgence. This is Canadian dollars that you're seeing right now. So 393 is going to be roughly I would say about $300 or so with exchange. So that would be one piece. And now we will go back to gem.app. So here is a ring, and this is another Lady Peep Show Stanhope with what they call the clear stone or rhinestone that is in it. Again, it's quite worn. Often these pieces, especially early pieces, were also made in base metal as well. So just something to be aware of. And then you've got, I would say, a hard to see image. I think they've attempted to print what it looks like inside the Stanhope lens. This is available on eBay. So I will share with you who the seller is in case you're interested. It is up all day. They have 100% positive th feedback. You can buy it now or make them an offer if you're interested. 
a bit of wear to this. Let's scroll down and see if there's any further information. They say that it is silver. Could be some tarnish. And it looks like there's further stones possibly on the side and top. So that would be another example of a Stanhope piece of jewelry that is available. Now, I really like this next one, and it is quite economical. This one is also available on eBay, 68 Canadian dollars, probably $54 USD. These are very popular tourist examples from Niagara Falls. So you've probably heard the story of the woman that went over the falls in a barrel. <laughs> that is why there is a barrel. Often you can find these made with opalescent or opaline glass. And they are also made sometimes um, of natural stone. There we go, get in close. So this one's on eBay. Let's figure out who the eBay seller is. It is Maberg-6368. Again, $50 US. Looks like my math was off. You can either place bid or make an offer. It looks like it's been around for a while, a while. Let's see what they say the materials of this one is. Satin spar is what they're saying the stone is. So not glass, although we will look at a glass one. And they say inside the barrel, you will see six photos of Niagara Falls. Pictures are perfectly clear. The title is Views of Niagara Falls on the top. And if you do some searching, you are going to find that these Niagara Falls Stanhopes are fairly common to find. I'm going to scroll down to this example. This is from Fiona Kenny Antiques. This one does have the opalescent glass beads in it, as well as that feldspar barrel on the end. And this would be worn. You could wear it still as a pendant today. There's that hole in the barrel for the Stanhope. So this is what I mean um, when I was saying that these touristy pieces were more easy to mass produce. It's quite lovely with the opalescent glass. I think this is a very sympathetic look. Um, so again, Fiona Kenny Antiques on Etsy, 115 Canadian dollars. I think this one's kind of cool. I've got uh, a sister who happens to be in Niagara Falls right now. And I, I'm actually gonna send her a couple of these later and say, you know, forget the modern tourist items that are available. You should look into getting something like this. It's a great gift for a memory. Yeah. Yes, it, it is very cute that they chose that barrel. I am catching up on comments. Look like there's not too, too many more. So let's go back to looking at what I've saved for you on gem.app. So we've got a couple rings. We've got one for 380 that we looked at. There is this one as well, which is extremely similar from Ruby Lane. That is um, another example. I'm just gonna click in and tell you who the seller is. So, oh, it is Stanhope's Microworks, 295. Looks like they may have this listed in multiple places or they may have a different one. This one they say is circa 1940s, 1950s, and it does use kind of a slightly older style to it. You can almost barely make out the image if you want to go and do that on your own time and zoom in. They say it is a new Gypsy Girl Stanhope in excellent condition. Size nine and three quarters US. All right. Now there's a couple more interesting ones here that I was able to come across that were one that was very reasonably priced. This is two antique Stanhope charms or fobs that feature the Lord's Prayer and Ten Commandments in miniature. And there we have it. They are on eBay. They don't have images of the images. It is 55 US dollars from looks like Ian Gran one good feedback. So when there's not a lot of detail, if something is, you know, a reasonable price, sometimes I will take a chance and it does look like they're in relatively good condition. 
Let's scroll down and see if they say anything more. Two antique Stanhope spyglass type charms, Lord Prayer, Ten Commandments, Condition, Light Scuffing, one inch each in length. And they are made in celluloid. So that tells us that they're probably from the early part of the 20th century. Again, $55 for two, you can make an offer and let's get in. Not a lot of scuffing. Made of celluloid, let's take a look at here. Ian Gran, 17446, if that is of interest to anyone. And then there's this very interesting one, a Bermuda onion Stanhope stick pin. Fascinating. I have not done any research on this to understand why somebody would create a Bermuda onion stick pin, but let's jump over to eBay and take a look at it and see what we can find. So. They do show us where the lens is. I'm gonna try to zoom in. I'm not really seeing much of anything. Here's the back of the onion or front. <laughs> and let's scroll down to see what they say. It's a boating dock in Bermuda, an interesting analogy considering it is a Bermuda onion. They say most likely a souvenir from Bermuda, two and one quarter inch long. Spectacular early 1900 Bermuda onion in very good condition. So this one's steeper. They are looking for 125 USD or you can make an offer and it is Q's Attic. They have 97.7 positive feedback, so I would go and, you know, read a little bit about their feedback or be very, very sure that I wanted the item before making a purchase. Um, but it is a interesting example, so I wanted to share that with all of you. Next up, I was able to find a couple of examples of rows of Sharon rings. We will do a search after and you'll see that there's more available, but they are on the more expensive side. This one, it, you know, it's a little bit clumsy, so the lines aren't super, super sharp, but we're also in an extreme close-up, so please keep that in mind. The style is definitely Victorian. This is um, a common kind of band that you would see. It's got some old engraving. Here's some photos as to what it would look like on the hand. We will pop over to Ruby Lane and find out whose shop this is. Okay, this is an antique cupboards shop. They are looking for 350 US dollars. You can also make them an offer. And they say that it fits a six and a half finger, weighs 1.35 diamond weight. And there is some wear to the amethyst and gold leaf flower design. So keep that in mind. It looks like part of the tail of the amethyst is missing or of the gold leaf flower, I should say. Um, and let's just take a look at the photos and make sure there's not a chip missing. And that's just faceting. Yeah, it appears to just be faceting. But this is one example that is available. 350 is on the lower side of what some of them are going for, or at least being asked for right now. Um, another example that I was able to find is this one here, which is more of a Rose de France ameth amethyst. It's a lighter purpley pink quite beautiful. This is what we would typically expect to see in terms of the stem and the leaves on these pieces. This one's available on eBay and the seller is National Treasures 22. They're looking for a $440 or best offer for this one. And we can see a little bit of wear to the facets. So this is why I love looking at anything that I'm going to buy, especially fine jewelry on my computer where I can zoom in, but you can see um, basically at that 12 o'clock point towards 11, 9, there's a little bit of wear. Beautiful band. Again, remember we are in an extreme close-up <laughs> always. Um, nice detail to this. We'll read what the size is or any other details that they were willing to share. It is a size 5.75, can be resized pre-1920s. Yes, it's definitely Victorian. Um, 
They say surrounded by a rose cut diamonds in a flower setting. Now there is not a surround of rose cut diamonds. So I would suggest, I would suggest perhaps double checking with them that the listing is 100% correct with the size if this is one that you're interested in. Um, because they may have copy pasted something from another listing as well, as there is no diamond surround. But again, National Treasures 22. I'm going to share one more of these Rose of Sharon brooches. So this one is 807 Canadian dollars, also on eBay. And this one is a brooch. It's got three of these rose cut diamonds, some pearls, and a really, really beautiful brooch setting. Nice early safety catch that is handmade and a hinge, definitely Victorian, what you want to see. And this is a nice close up and it looks like they're fairly nice quality rose cut diamonds as well. It's a bit unusual to see them in uh, silver, but you do see these sometimes with that inlay. And so let's go over to eBay. This one comes from Estate Sale 33, 595 US dollars. They do not have a best offer option on this. Do they have any notes of matter? They say it is uh, one inch tall by one and five inches wide, 14 karat gold, 7.6 grams. Pinback works great which is all information that you'd want to see. And then what's nice about a brooch, as we hover over the image and close up, you see a couple hairs and fingerprints, but the facets are far less worn than what one sees typically inside rings because rings are on our fingers and tend to get knocked about a fair bit. So this one's in quite nice condition, as you can see, nice and shiny. And again, those rose cuts also kind of stand out. I'll give it a little look see in the back looks pretty good to me. So I'm going to stop sharing for a second and pop back. Hello, everyone. It is lovely to see you all. Hi, Bruce. Great to see you. Lauren as well. Catching up on some comments. It is the Victorian Trends, Unusual Trends Sunday Brunch. Hi, Galilee Dreams. And Soho California Vintage. And Sharon, great to see you all. All right, and Sherry, let's keep going. I've got a few more items that I pre-shopped. And then if you want to put requests into the chat, I am more than happy to also look for your requests. I can take a look for some puzzle names as well. So let's add back to the stream our gem dot app. The last three items that we have are three of these Velge Fusée watch cock pieces of jewelry. And I tried to find some that were relatively economical. Some are significantly more expensive. Let us begin with the most economical from Wassail Antiques on Etsy. So here we have one of these watch cocks that was made into a brooch. And I am going to actually click in so that we can zoom in on it because, oh no, the shop is taking a short break. I'm going to have to go back. The good news is that if you're interested in this, it is not sold yet. And I would suggest reaching out and there's probably gonna be a flurry. But why I wanted to take you to the shop so that we could zoom in, which we won't be able to do right now, is to get a close look on this piece right at six o'clock at the bottom of what I'm going to call the globe of this. Do you see what that is? It is an urn. So again, these were being engraved in the 17th, 18th, 19th centuries with anything that was meaningful or beautiful and urns or willows, flowers, as well as faces were all very, very common motifs. So it is not at all surprising to see this here. They, the person who placed the order may have requested that the piece somehow be tied with a little bit of a personal memorial that they had as well. Let's take a look at the back. 
We've got our tube hinge and seat catch. It is so cool to me how they repurpose these pieces. So with sale antiques, set your reminders, consider sending them an email if you're interested. 69 Canadian, probably just over 50 USD is a pretty good bargain for this. We are gonna go at the next least expensive one. And this one is from Green Banks on Etsy. And what I loved about this one is that sort of green man face that is at the bottom kind of six o'clock point. It is that beautiful hand engraved kind of filigree. This is a good picture that allows you to see the details on that face. So 95 Canadian dollars is probably right around 70 US dollars or so. And again, this is sort of an, an earlier type of pin. Earlier 20th century, I would say, when it was repurposed, um, but using that very antique watchcock. It's a good look to it. I really like the face on this guy. So Green Bank, it's Etsy. And then our final example is on Ruby Lane. And this example also has three pearls that are set in it. So you can sometimes find them where they have gemstones that have been set in it. Like that example that we looked at early on that had um, turquoise. This one focuses instead on pearls. This one's on Ruby Lane. And we are going to jump over to the shop. This is from the shop from Jillian, and it's 95 US dollars. Let's zoom in. It looks like there's a bit of a shell motif as well as flowers. And this one is a pin and pendant as well. So multi-purpose, you can wear it in a couple of ways. Now, I would say it does look like there may be a small little break in the filigree on the bottom. Yep, and I can see it here too. So, as always, we like to be able to zoom. So just be aware of that. And it looks like the design here, where we saw a man's face on the last one, we've got a shell. And then it looks like almost like ferns and flowers. So if you're interested in this one, this one is on the From Jillian shop on Ruby Lane. Okay, I am going to pop back in to see what messages I have missed in chat. My pleasure, Jagar. I love to do this. It brings me great joy. And I will tell you, I was having a little bit too much fun yesterday as I was putting together today's show and like looking up things at the wee wee hours. So Deborah, it sounds like you want me to look up Egyptian revival, which I most certainly can. Hey, Jack, great to see you. Hey, Christina. All right, we are going to look for Egyptian, Egyptian revival on gem.app. And if there's anything specific that you want, let me know. Callie, it will absolutely be up for replay. And if ever there's questions, don't hesitate to reach out as well. So let's share and start looking up Egyptian Revival. Okay. I'm going to jump in, close out a couple of these things. Now, Egyptian Revival covers quite a few revivals. So we're going to type this in, pull it up, see what we find. I will pop back into chat as well to see if there's anything specific that is being looked for. So if it's like Victorian Revival, Art Deco Revival, 1970s Revival. Um, and Jack, I love Revival pieces too. And the art archaeological revival pieces from like 1960s are amazing. I would love to see your Greek Hellenistic revival, Birch Jack. Okay, let's begin. I am going to start to scroll. Now I have a type. 
<laughs> you, you, as you saw with the name bridges, things like this. So these shapes of frames were very common and this particular frame shape became quite common around the Art Deco period as well. So you often see it. Um, telltale signs include this kind of like V shape, like sun rays or something around the outside. And you often see this on, arch okay, on let me try that again, the Egyptian revival pieces, and they're beautiful. And I just love the cutouts. There's something about the way those look when you put them on. Um, I may as well tell you who is offering this. So $75 USD on this one. And this is Gallery du Louvre Antiques. They have 100% positive feedback. They are willing to entertain offers as well. And we will take a look little closer. So there on the sides, you can kind of make out those sun rays, as I call them, and that rope chain. And then of course, we have Isis, scarabs, an onk at the top. Love, love, love that kind of detail. Okay, so again, this one looks like it was actually likely made in Egypt. And I say that because of the marking that we see kind of smack in the center. Those are generally the Egyptian markings. Um, with that trombone closure, it's possible that pieces were, were made. And like often people say these were only found in France, but that's not quite true. They were used in other countries as well. It's possible that this work was done and exported to France to be finished but I don't see French marks, although maybe I do right at the bottom. Let's keep getting in close. Looks like a partial mark down there. Love this piece. Okay, this is a beauty. Let's see what they say about it. They say sterling silver Egyptian revival brooch pendant marked on the back. 1.5 inches in diameter. Always check the size. Sometimes things are deceptively small. Um, Gallery du Louvre Antiques would be the place to go if you are interested in this one. We're going to go back and keep looking. Uh, Deborah, what era is this? I would say this one's like 20s, 30s. I would say it's the Art Deco revival. Oh, we have someone whose favorite is the faience pieces. I love those too. Okay, let's keep going. We will try to find some good faience pieces. Now this one, they say vintage Egyptian revival faience scarab necklace available from Ruby Lane, seller in Canada. I'm going to click in. It's from the Vintage Jewelry Boutique. Now with faience pieces. What is interesting is that when they're heavily glazed, like you see on these scarabs, sometimes these are made for jewelry specifically and not so much the like loose scarabs that are picked up on the side of the road that have been repurposed from archaeological digs. Um, so let's scroll down and see what they say. They say a 1960s era purchased in Egypt quite possibly a tourist item, 15 inches in length, drop is one and one quarter inch in good condition. There are a couple of tiny missing beads and a turquoise bead that shows peeling. Yeah, so sounds to me like likely made for the tourist market, $65 USD, not an unreasonable price. Looks like there's a nice combination of glass as well as the faience that is in it and costume. I'm going to resume sharing this tab as we scroll. Okay, these pieces are incredible. We're going to jump over after we scroll through. So this is a combination of like the faience and the coral. You've got a parure here. So bracelet, necklace, and earrings from Lee Kaplan Vintage on Etsy. And they say this is from the 1920s. Can be seen in Ellie Lobner's book, Fashions of the Roaring Twenties, on page 135, and Roseanne Edinger's book, Popular Jewelry, 1840-1940, on page 8. No broken beads. Probably check. So I'm going to zoom in. 
and allow us to get a good look at some of this work. So can you imagine how much time it took to put this together? We have tiny little hoops, a lot of beading that needed to be strung, the dangles on the bottom too, they're almost like tassels, and those early clip earrings too, which I'm gonna click on. I don't know how comfortable these would be, but <laughs> who am I to judge? Beautiful piece. All right, so this one, if you are interested, is available from Lee Kaplan Vintage. And we will keep on looking. Now, I need to know why this is $807. It is on Ruby Lane from Cambridge Antiques. It is half price, no. With the conversion and the discount, in US dollars, it is 447, which feels like half price, but it's truly not for us that are in Canada. Um, I would like to know more. So they say it is a necklace that is hallmarked with an Arabic mark in solid gilded silver, the entire front service being decorated in hieroglyphics with carnelian, turquoise, and jade. Okay, so they are considering this to be fine jewelry. We are going to zoom in and see some of these details. And here we go. All right. So each of these panels has been engraved and detailed with hieroglyphics. That is beautiful. See, sometimes when you are simply on like gem.app, you need to go in and see the listing to really be able to appreciate it. And I love to do this, even if it's not in my price range or not what I'm looking for. It is a great way to be able to go and discover and learn more about different pieces and styles. And the work on this is really quite beautiful. We'll zoom in one more time. I'm curious if it actually says anything. All right. So on sale 25% off right now as part of the Ruby Lane Spotlight, Cambridge Antiques, if you are interested. And we are going to go back to Ruby Lane. We'll go to this costume piece. So this is a 1970s revival piece from Zuzu Bijou on Etsy. And the photos will eventually load. There we go. Now, in terms of a revival piece, this one is quite well done with a lot of detail. It's got some glass rhinestones, you do see that scarab, which is probably a glazed, like recreated, almost like porcelain, as well as, you know, rope detail. Nicely made costume piece for sure. Let's take a look at the back. Celebrity gems. I don't know the market on these, so I can't tell you if this is a good price or not, but it's $91.91 Canadian. Um, we will go back to gem.app and I'm just going to quickly pop into the chat again and see if I've missed any comments. Oh, I think I have missed comments. Amazing, Jack. I will take a look at those photos from Judy. Egyptians had thousands of gods. Faience. So faience is almost like a like pottery type. It's not stone, but it is recognized as being like a stone-like material, but really, truly, it's pottery that's been glazed. Um, and that was used by the Egyptians for the scarabs that they would create, and also for a lot of the beads that they would use for their jewelry as well. It is a weird amount, 91.91. Totally agree, Marlene. All right, shall we continue with the Egyptian revival? I will continue with it unless anyone has a different preference. Okay. Just for fun, let's touch on this. A 1920s Egyptian revival lapis lazuli 14 carat scarab necklace. Beautiful. 
out of the range. <laughs> um, but the clasp on this is quite interesting. So let's jump to this photo. Very well made. I love the carvings. Clearly all done by the same carver as we've got like these little star designs. Very nice piece. You know what? I am going to look up puzzle names. and see if there are any brooches, which may be any of your names. If we can figure out what on earth they say. So this one here is an Edie. So if we have any Ediths among the group, it is a beauty. It is from Verona's on Etsy, and that's actually a pretty good price, 75 Canadian, which is 58 25% off. I'll show you the back on this as well. So it's pretty common for there to be um, sometimes replacement hinges on these. It seems like when they were worn, they were worn a lot, or replacement clasps. And in terms of size, they're usually around the same size. So greater than a quarter, kind of like the size of the one that I have on today. Um, make sure that if you are interested in this one, you do note that there appears to be just a little bit of like solder type markings, maybe repair that was done to the piece. Okay. Next, we will take a look at this one here. So this one is Sissy for Cecilia. I have looked at this one in the past and it is upside down in the photo. So this one's on eBay. Um, I think, no, it's still, it's right side up in this photo, upside down in this photo. You gotta flip it. <laughs> so you see a big C and then an I and then an S and an S and then they reuse the I inside the bigger I and then an E. So if you know a Cecilia or you are a sissy, this is a nice choice. It is coming from Australia and I am going to quickly share this tab. So this one is available from Redbeard's A1 and it is on eBay. And what I love about these is all of the detail that goes into each letter. So in order to make each letter stand out, what they've done is they've engraved them and usually with different patterns. So sometimes it's a dot pattern or feathering or just hatch marks, um, but that is what allows us to be able to read what is on the puzzle name brooch. Now, sometimes you will come across examples like this one, um, and this is actually not a puzzle name brooch. It is an AEI for Amity, Eternity, and Infinity, I believe, but I would need to validate that because I always get tripped up. <laughs> but it isn't a name, it is just a sentiment. Um, still really wonderful piece. Um, just keep that in mind. I have seen some people suggest that they say something else, like Amy, that is misspelled, etc. Now, these ones are on the deer side for sure at 170. This one is an Annie. It is from eBay in the UK. The seller is Allen's Bits and Bobs. You can really clearly see all of the different engraving that was done to make the letters stand out. And this one is a very interesting puzzle in that um, the letters are, are not just like red, right to left, left to right, etc. So beautiful example. They do accept an offer. If you are an Annie, perhaps this one's of interest to you. There's another AEI. And this last one is also an Edith and it is available from eBay. I believe it's the same seller. Yes, it is, Allen's Bits and Bobs. Again, another example that is finely engraved. And there we have those puzzle brooches. I think we did them all. 
Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing for a moment, pop back into chat. Thank you for pulling that up, Timeless Jewelry by Deborah. Faience is made of common materials, quartz, alkaline salts, lime, mineral-based colorants. All right, do you have any further requests for me to research jewelry or should I jump into acrostic jewelry to see if we can find anything on gem.app today? We're gonna search two ways then. We will search for acrostic jewelry and we will also search by looking for combinations of gemstones. So let's jump right in. And I will share my screen again. So we'll start with acrostic. Now, if you look up acrostic or go into a shop saying, show me your acrostic jewelry, please, they will know <laughs> that if they know what they have, they will price it accordingly. I'm gonna start with this one. This is from Runes and Rebus on Etsy. It is lovely. I have a feeling this is going to be paste and gold filled and a little on the dear side, but it is a lover's knot that has a ruby emerald garnet, amethyst ruby diamond, um, and that is going to be regard. So runes and rebus. Let's go there on Etsy and see what they have to say. Gold fill and paste. I suspected as much for this price range. Um, if you were looking at fine jewelry like this, normally they would be upwards of a thousand dollars. So just a heads up. Sometimes when you see a deal that looks too good, could be. But this beautiful paste is nice quality. Still on the dear side. It's nice to see it in action. And so really this is like a double nod to love. Having that lover's nod, not, and also the message here too. So beautiful example. We are going to keep looking. We will take a look at... I'd say, you know, let's look for a bargain, but we're probably not going to find one looking at acrostic. Here's the example that we looked at today. All right, we're going to click on this one. It is another regard in paste and very expensive. Now, one thing to note is that these really have had a resurgence in popularity, and that means that there are reproductions that are out there. So if you are in the market and you truly want an antique piece, make sure that you find one that is either hallmarked or has the appropriate indicators so that you, you know, aren't overpaying for what you get. This one is 532 Canadian dollars, and they say it is from the 1970s. So this is going to be an example of a newer piece. And again, it is a regard. I'm gonna scroll down. It is a 1970s multi gemstone. So just something to keep in mind if you are in the market. This seller on Etsy is Mungo's Mine. Now they've called this one acrostic, but they're all the same color. So we are going to pass that by. And instead, take a look at this ring from the Phoenix Room in Australia. So we have diamond, emerald, amethyst, ruby, emerald, probably a sapphire. Can't quite make it out. Let's see what they say. They're saying this one is vintage and not antique, which helps explain the price of 359 Canadian. Um, gorgeous rainbow ring, they give us the history. 
Sapphire and Topaz. Okay. It is a size seven and three quarters, just shy of an eight. And let's take a look closer to see if we can find any marks. No marks, but this gallery does not look quite so handmade. So I think that Vintage Repro is exactly what this guy is. So another beautiful one. All right, we're gonna jump in on the big guy, this heavy hitter. A Georgian Dearest Acrostic Pendant, 18 karat yellow gold from Antique Jewels London on Etsy. It is indeed a dear price for a dearest brooch, but why not take a look? It is a beauty. No harm in looking. It is a free activity. So the reason why I want to jump in on this one is take a, to take a look at some of the canateal. We've got some really beautiful detailing here with like that rope work that is kind of piled up high in that conical shape. That's really beautiful and the ball details as well. Um, and that is really what is referred to as canateal. And on the back, this is very common on Georgian pieces as well, usually for hair pieces where it's kind of almost like this bulbous shape. Sometimes you even see the pin stem will be like bent to be a little bit larger and then come in. And can be worn as both pin and pendant. So let's see. They say that they believe it dates to 1820, diamond, emerald, amethyst, ruby, emerald, sapphire, turquoise. So it would be red like the face of a clock. How lovely. Okay, we are gonna keep going. Secret histories on Etsy. So this one is 704 Canadian dollars. Lucky in love antique acrostic wishbone brooch. Old cut gemstones, 15 karat gold. Let's see if they have a video or anything. Otherwise we will get in close. So we do have that wishbone shape for luck. And the photos are taking a moment to load. Here's the back, marked 15 karat. And a ruby emerald garnet, amethyst ruby diamond for regard. Yes, that is exactly what they've confirmed. Okay, so do they have any other details here? 16 by 31 millimeters, 3.21 grams. I do like that she's showed us what it looks like on if this photo will load because it is a little bit on the smaller side, um, but also gold. There we have it. A lot of people are wearing their brooches exactly like this suspended from chains. Okay, as promised, we are going to do a little bit of a search Instead of looking for the acrostic, we are going to look for diamond, sapphire, ruby, emerald. And see what we come up with. Because if it is not identified as acrostic, we have a better chance of finding a good deal. Oh, I'm sorry. Delia, you may need to refresh. Let me know if you're not seeing um, the gem.app screen that I'm on, where I am just scrolling now. And I have found a ring, which we're gonna take a look at from Treasure Box 83. It is a 14 karat gold lover's knot ring in a couple of tones. Um, it's interesting because this is not an acrostic ring, but simply has a pattern with those stones mentioned. So we've got emeralds, diamonds, and rubies. 
available in Canada. We'll keep looking. Here we have another floral bouquet, beautiful, but does not appear to spell anything with diamond, emerald, likely ruby, diamond, D-A-R-D, D, S, N, no, unless it has secret meaning or unless it is in another language. So do keep that in mind as well. Let's take a look. I have a feeling this is just a really beautiful brooch. And I do like how it's got the trombone as well as an extra pin could have been used also for like a, a thicker garment or like a fur. Okay, let's keep going and see if anything stands out as being potentially acrostic. We are going to hit up all of the uh, expensive items as we have typed the gemstones and precious gemstones at that inside the chat. Search bar. And let me know if there's anything else you want me to search on too. So this is what I do is I will search on alternate ways of looking for things in hopes of coming across something special. I'm going to click on this. So I do think this may say something. We've got ruby, emerald, sapphire, amethyst, emerald, sapphire. Hmm. It might be in another language too. Let's see what eBay says. They have not marked it as acrostic, but it'll be something to research to see if it might mean something later on. Now, it could just be the same patterns of ruby, emerald, sapphire, ruby, emerald, sapphire, ruby, emerald, sapphire repeated, or maybe it's something else. So. I'll dig into that a little bit later and report back if I find anything interesting. Sapphires, diamonds, and rubies. Yes. Okay, perfect. I am going to search on that now for you. So we are going to look up just diamond, sapphire, ruby, and see if we find any jewelry jewels. Aha, I would bet this is likely from the period. It has all the right detailing. They say antique 14 karat gold, diamond, sapphire, ruby locket. So this one is from Van Lux Resale. They say workmanship and design looks Russian. Well, maybe a little Russian, but also the same design and workmanship was used in um, Europe as well as Great Britain. I've seen these types of closures before. Um, so hard to say. I don't think I quite agree with them. I think it could be continental. If it was Russian, it would likely be rose gold as well. And this to me is a little bit more yellow, um, but right time period. So right around the turn, I'd say, of the 19th century and beautiful sapphire, as well as diamonds and rubies. Let's see what else we can find. So really, those are kind of the indicators, is you want to look for things from that time frame, And then let's jump into here. And then also the materials. So here they say you get two antique 10 karat gold, diamond, sapphire, and ruby and pearl pins and brooches. So these aren't all combined in the same ones. So from the right time frame, right materials, but not the right combination. I wouldn't personally call these Jubilee jewels, although they could have been worn around that point in time. Um, I'm still going to share the seller with you because this is not a bad price for two brooches. 
especially if you can get a deal on it. Sometimes if you favorite things, sellers will make you an offer. So Windago2293, two lovely brooches, looks like pearl and ruby. Um, that is potentially also set in silver, hard to say. And then another one that is sapphire and diamond. Okay. Now let's go back to looking for these stones all set together in an antique piece. So diamond, sapphire, ruby. We will look up Jubilee shortly as well. Aha. Now here is a great one. This one's from Lang Antiques. Definitely says Jubilee jewelry time frame to me too. Nice front large old cut stones, and then the gallery. So as opposed to that one that we were looking at in Australia for the acrostic rings, where it was um, clearly machine made, this one we can see is all handmade. And it looks beautiful on the hand. Let's keep looking. Here's another one. So They've called this one Patriotic Ruby Diamond and Sapphire Ring. I am inclined to agree. Ruby Diamond Sapphire from the Velvet Box Society on Etsy. This one's more modern, as is this. So we will keep going. I do like this shape although it is not what we are looking for. Here's another form of patriotic. <laughs> okay, this one is available from Goldfinch West Coast and it is a beauty. Again, right time frame. there is a light ruby that is almost a pink sapphire. They're calling a star ruby and then a star sapphire in blue as well. 18 karat gold, a hinge rope twist bangle, nice tall crown settings. I am going to see if I can get us in closer. Nope, they don't have those video, those photos. Let's jump in. What I want to show you on this one, um, oh, they do have a video. First, let's look at their video. And then what I want to show you is some detail that we can see on the sapphire that helps us know that it's natural. Um, so when you get a sapphire, there's a few ways you want to look for silks in it, and it is the silk that is actually going to create this asterism. And if it has been heat treated, um, that actually destroys the silks, which can destroy the asterism. So the clearer the stone with a star, the more expensive and valuable it will be. And so what I want to take a look at is there was one side angle, I think it's here, that allows us to see some of those like natural colorations. So at about 11 o'clock on the sapphire where I'm hovering over, you can almost make out like a little bit of like brown and same thing at about, I would say four o'clock as well. Beautiful. Okay. Again, not what I'm quite in the market for today. Maybe one of you are Goldfinch West Coast on Etsy. I have bought from them many times in the past. They're great. Here's an interesting one from Trademark Antiques. So it almost looks like a V for victory or a crown, which is similar to some of the crown earrings that I have on. Antique Ruby, Sapphire, Diamond, Tiara Ring. Now, this diamond doesn't quite look so clear as I would want for it to be. And here's one. Okay, Ruby Lane, who's got this? Oh, it has sold. <laughs> well, we're still going to look at it for fun. This was from Romanov, Russia. 
and it was a heartbreaker. Take a look at the bow detail, as well as the diamonds, the sapphire, and the ruby. And that construction in the back, beautiful. No longer available. I am going to pause for a moment and pop back. Hello everyone, it is lovely to see you all. I'm going to remove that. Hi Teresa, hi Antique Agenda, and everyone else. I hope you're having a great Sunday. I need to close a couple of tabs because just about every tab, every item that we've looked at together has remained open in my browser. So I've got 25 or so open right now. We're gonna close a few. Let's me stay organized and access the tab that we're on. Do we have any last requests to search for today? Otherwise, a reminder, our next Sunday brunch is going to be on September 3rd, which is Labor Day weekend. Um, we're going to be covering amylite as well as organic gemstones and their evolution through time. Um, and not just the evolution in terms of how are they created, but also how were they used and when did they become? recognized as gemstones because there's different timelines for all of them. Um, and Sunday the 3rd is also going to be a double header. So for the Extra Scoop Club, we will also have our next live event. And I do invite you to get your photos and videos into me at extrascoop at gmail.com. And at these events, what we do is we essentially look at pieces that belong to our viewers, and we do some research on them. I share information that I've prepared in advance, as well as a bit of evaluation in terms of what are the current retail asking prices for that item as well. So if you are interested in joining, you can join on YouTube or Patreon. There's a post in the community tab if you want more information on that, um, and it's going to be a lot of fun. Thank you all so much for being here. It has been an absolute delight. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out. Or if you have an idea for a show, those are always welcome too. I appreciate your support. This is honestly so much more than, than just a hobby. It is a community and it is, you know, a lot of fun to get to do this research and share it with all of you. So thank you for making the time to be here and have a wonderful day. Oh, Deborah. You have a challenge for me. I will take it. Please send it to me and let's see what I can find. I will see you all soon. Stay connected. Please do hit the thumbs up and subscribe if you have not. Otherwise, we'll see you soon. Have a wonderful rest of your Sunday wherever you are. Bye, everybody.